So I'll introduce each, uh, each, each speaker just as we go. Uh, so Ruben, if you're happy, just put your hands up and say hello. Hello. So Ruben is the Secretary General for Forum Oceano, Portugal Blue Economy Cluster. He's the president of the advisory board of NOAA Regen, which invests in protecting the oceans with blue tech innovations and blue carbon credits. And he's a strategic advisor to Sea Wind Ocean Technology, which makes floating offshore, offshore wind sustainable, safe, and cost effective for all seas and oceans. Fun fact is he doesn't know how to drive. He can swim, he can sail, but he doesn't have a drive license or know how to drive. In his words, my action in my public role is to, drive, uh, to act as a blue eco innovation activist for achieving the ocean triple bottom line policy goal, people, planet, okay. and, pra uh, planet and profit. So, so welcome, uh, Ruben. Uh, so first question is how can we monetize the ocean with a positive impact? Well, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, first of all, many thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, we are now uh, one day uh, is left uh, for the end of the One Ocean Conference, and also for the end of uh, all this. Also, is happening here uh, are the One Sustainable Ocean venue, ocean, ocean business and science. But it's the end. Not it's the end of the event, not the end of the process. In fact. Uh, what um, I sense uh, and what I, uh, from what is happening every day from the feedback that we are having is that uh, the, I think we are living and not being over optimistic, but I think we ha also have to have some optimism in the challenge that we have to face. This is an ignition moment of the blue innovation ecosystem, not only in Portugal, but in the global link. Because uh, things are happening here, and as you can see, there, are, there is already uh, some skin on the game. This is what Reef Company uh, is doing. Sorry. Uh, and, and, and is going forward, is attracting investment, is driving innovation for solving uh, a problem, but while making profit. And this is uh, one way of, pr and one of the most effective ways of protecting the ocean, is if you can build a business model for making profit from the ocean, that the base is ocean health, a healthy ocean. And this is what has to change in, in, uh, in the way we do business. So, uh, uh, so wrapping up, the, all the business models that we have today is extract without taking care of the impact, without taking care of the, renew the renewability of the resources, and that is kind of a lazy engineering because you make you know, the machine work does the, the operation, extracts, but then what is left? So what we have to do, and the new generation of engineers already perspectives the process like this is really to decarbonize and circularize the, pro the processes. The, who invests and also the corporates have to grasp that this is the new way of generating wealth. And this is not only you know, a, a nice words uh, or, or inspiring words that you can show in a PowerPoint and make something beautiful and so on. This is a smart way of investing. And why? Because when you focus, when you have a deep focus in the environmental impacts and, all, and the overall impacts of your operations, you have to design more carefully and with more attention how the, uh, the industrial process is going to deliver and how is the risk is going to be managed. So when a process and an industrial business is designed to be environmentally 
you know, zero impact, it's also less risky in terms of operations. So, and less risky in terms of operations means one thing, it's safer for, more and safer and is a smarter investment. This is why in the last, you know, one year and a half, as it was reported by the Financial Times, more than 20% of the, of the argument of the financial transactions are ESG driven. But it's not only because they want, uh, or because of, I would say, uh, a matter of conscience of the investor. It's because it's a safer, uh, could be also because of that, but also because it's a safer and smarter way to put your money in a very volatile environment that we have now at the moment. So this is, the, this is why if it's true, if it's a true green or blue innovation, and this is not only in blue economy, uh, that's what, but it's all, uh, also in the all economy. If you focus in doing you know, the business model with uh, this kind of risk management, risk focus in protecting the environment because it also will diminish your risk, it is, will protect your investments and will protect uh, the environment. In blue economy, this is more, this is more needed than why. Because investing in ocean is much, much riskier and much, capital, much more capital intensive than in other sectors. And this is, what, uh, this is where science has to be in there to meet technology and then to make the right innovation. Thank you, Ruben. It's a very exciting time uh, in the role of business in creating new business models that will protect and make our oceans healthy. Uh, it's an exciting time, and thank you for sharing your initial insights, Ruben. The second um, speaker is uh, Lisa Marachino. Uh, Lisa is the CEO of Proteus Ocean Group. She's an expert in raising capital, business optimization, strategic planning, research, and investing in public, private, and alternative investments. She identifies cutting edge tools and capitalizes on emerging trends. Includes interests include social impact, brand, and influencer marketing, blockchain, crypto, and millennials. That's a lot of stuff. Fun fact, she has two teenagers and she has two naked cats, which means the cats have got less hair than I have. <laughs> um, and she loves the ocean, having stopped being a scuba diver since she was 20 years old. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you. First question. Yes. The blue economy pales in comparison to the space economy. Why is that and what can we do to change it? Ah, thank you. That's a very good question. And thank you all for being here. Um, well, it, it is an interesting question. I do think that the space race a long time ago, maybe because of John F. Kennedy, took off versus the ocean race. Uh, but the space and ocean have a lot more similarities than they do differences. But one of the biggest differences is the amount of capital that has gone in to space versus oceans. In the last 10 years alone, $200 billion has gone into space, creating over 1,500 new companies. And that really pales in comparison to what has been invested in ocean. And as we think about outer space and inner space, we look at what we need to do today for our planet and the space that we have here on Earth, we know that it is time to save our ocean. We also know that, uh, we, I mean, we also know that we must harness what's going on in space to turn our attention and drive capital innovation and solutions right here on Earth and save our oceans. So we at Proteus, we have one big idea, and we think that the answer lies in actually building the International Space Station of the ocean. And putting something like that in the ocean will drive that global engagement, drive innovations, and drive solutions. So I have um, the pleasure and the honor of working with our visionary, Fabian Cousteau. Fabian is uh, an ocean explorer, He's uh, the, third, uh, the first grandson of Jacques-Yves Cousteau, and he's been a third generation aquanaut. And what an aquanaut is, is someone that who can live and work underwater. So in 2014, 
he um, endeavored on an expedition to live and work one more day than his grandfather did in the ocean in our last existing habitat that's over 35 years old. It's called Aquarius. And unfortunately, it's, it sits on a, a, almost a dead reef, coral reef, which is very sad, right in the backyard in, in the United States. But what this expedition did for 31 days with five scientists, two women, which we're really proud of, it, 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 it resulted in some incredible things. One, they tested new technologies that had never been tested before. One was an edutronic camera that uh, caught the cavitational bubble of a grouper that was hotter than the hottest part of the sun. They tested Muse, which is, uh, it, it checks your circadian rhythms. They also talked to 100,000 students from the bottom of the ocean and Skype in the classroom all around the globe. Imagine what it would be like to be sitting in China or Australia or the United States and watching Fabien Cousteau teach something about the oceans. That might be something that would drive people to look at the ocean the way they look at space. But the other thing that was incredible is they all did, those five scientists and Fabien Cousteau, conducted three years worth of research in 31 days. Why were they able to do that? Because when you're saturated and you're living and working at depth, you can dive up to 10 to 12 hours a day. Really, you're only limited by the amount of time that you want to sleep and eat and other things. So they were able to go out into the ocean column, come back to their home, and then do more work and talk about the experiments and the science that was happening right in their backyard. So at the end of the 31 days, when Fabian was done with this expedition, he came up and they asked him, what do you want to do next, Mr. Cousteau? And he said, I want to build this bigger and better because if we were able to achieve this in a small tin can in the Keys, imagine what we can do if we can build this bigger and better. So Proteus and the idea of Proteus was born that day. It's taken quite a few years to get us where we are today, but we uh, at Proteus Ocean Group believe that Proteus will change the way that global engagement, science, research and development is being done today. We think it will give birth to new ideas, new innovations and new companies. And these are the kinds of things that are needed in our ocean today. We need to not, we know what's happened in the past. We need to understand our ocean today and drive solutions because we are out of time. And one of the things that Proteus will do is actually accelerate that time. So I hope that Proteus and all the companies here are really going to drive this idea that we need the capital, not just uh, the private sector, but the public sector and government entities, all of those three as public-private uh, partnerships to really advance where we need to be, not in 10 years, but sooner than that. Fascinating. What a dream. Yes. May I take the second question? Sure. So we look at the ocean, we see flat and blue. It all looks as well as if everything is fine, but we know that's not. How can we drive awareness of what's really going on down there? I mean, that's a great question. I think, um, again, I'm lucky to be uh, with a visionary who comes from an award-winning family of filmmakers and storytellers. And I think that we are missing that part of the ocean. We're missing the really the public engagement piece, the driving the local communities to understand and help. And I think that storytelling, when you think about space, they really engage us, right? Every child looks up to the sky and says, I want to be an astronaut. Well, we're missing that. And what we hope to do at Proteus and with the community of global public-private partnerships is tell the stories, the success stories of, of what it is to be a Fabian Cousteau when he was four years old and started scuba diving. He says the ocean was his classroom. It is. You know, we need to change that. We need to make it exciting so that every child in this world 
who doesn't hasn't even put a toe in the water can know what it feels like to be Fabian and, and be in the in the fireworks of display that is our ocean, which has changed. We know it's changed. It, the places he used to visit when he was a child are not that anymore. Even the places I scuba dived years ago. But we have an opportunity to change that through storytelling. You know, the day that Fabian descends down and up into Proteus in a few years, we hope that every person is looking at their watch, their phone, their TV, or whatever instrument, and experiencing that like it's our moon landing, like it's our generation's moon landing, because it is. We're dependent on the ocean as if our life depends on it. It does. So those are the stories that I think we need to tell. Wonderful. And finally, what roles do business and individuals have in these issues? I think there are critical roles, and I think we all need to take responsibility in part as executives, as entrepreneurs, as investors, as government entities. We all have a part to play. I sometimes think that children and the youth these days are so overwhelmed by what's going on in the news. There is no hope. And what I do love about working with Fabian is he is about hope. He doesn't talk about what's impossible, but he talks about what's possible. And I do think that it takes a whole community, even the smallest thing, stop using straws or whatever. The children and the youth need to know that they can play a part just like we all need to play a part. It's our duty to all play a part in the solution. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. For, uh, your Three fantastic answers. No problem. So we'll come back to you later. So um, third up is is uh, Lena Konstantinovic, and uh, Lena is the founder and CEO of Innovation 4.4, and she's also the founding partner in the BVC Fund and Ocean Impact Investment Fund. Innovation 4.4 accelerates the commercialization and deployment of strategically selected and vetted water, energy, health, material science, and space technology most critical to achieve the Paris Agreement and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. She's spoken at over 350 conferences over the last 10 years, including at the Nobel Prize Summit, the United Nations and NASA Centennial Challenge launch. Fun fact, Lena was in a music video called Cake Going the Distance, um, <laughs> which, which was on MTV. So welcome, Lena. First question. Is SDG 14 is the second last SDG in terms of getting funding? What can we do to turn this around? Thank you, that's a great question. We have so many great solutions represented here on the panel and um, so many other uh, organizations that support innovation and research and um, the many other elements, policy and so on. However, funding is really critical to be a, being able to implement these solutions in the time frame that we have, which is not long as most of you uh, likely understand. So there are new opportunities or ways of looking at funding that um, open up uh, greater deployment of capital, both philanthropic and investment capital to uh, ocean solutions. And there's a few that I'd like to talk about. So there's, um, on the philanthropy <coughs> side, a new form, for example, in the United States that's called a DAF. It's a philanthropic vehicle where you can donate and receive a tax credit and direct that donation to go towards the philanthropic uh, purpose of your choice, for example, oceans. What can be done with that philanthropic donation, though, is as it acts as an endowment and is typically invested in the market, in mutual funds and other non-impact and non-ocean related investment vehicles. Instead, it can be invested into an impact investing fund that is mission aligned, that can, if successful, 10x or increase that funding by 10 times and then be deployed towards uh, the initial philanthropic purpose so that it both funds early stage solutions on the for-profit side and it provides funding 10 times more than was donated for uh, non-profit solutions. So it's these kinds of innovative ways of using the structures that exist that can open up new opportunities and ensure that the funding that's needed for all of these solutions is available. 
Um, so, <laughs> so in terms of funding structures, there are some really interesting. Um, sorry, should I wait till the announcement is over? <laughs> Perfectly. So okay, great, great, fine, great yeah. wonderful. Um, so in terms of um, funding structures, family offices, foundations, impact investing funds, VC funds, private equity funds are all different structures that potentially can come into play at different parts in uh, different stages of that journey. And what's really important is to understand how each type of funding can play a role at what stage and where it's appropriate so that we can optimize these structures to really um, function in a way where it reduces the time that both NGOs and, um, and startups and companies spend on raising money so that they can optimize and accelerate the deployment of solutions. And so this is why the funding structures are really important. Um, and family offices have a really important role to play because of a different focus. So as was mentioned earlier by Ruben, 20% of investment is ESG investment. When you talk to family offices, and we've done some surveys on this, 80% of family offices ask about impact first. If you are a fund or a company or anyone seeking capital from family offices, the first question is about impact. And I think that this is why family offices present a really significant um, opportunity and a role, have an important role to play in funding ocean solutions. How many of you know what family offices are? Okay, so less than half. Okay, so I'll take some time to explain what family offices are. So when a family has more than a hundred million in wealth, they typically would set up their own investment vehicle. So they would hire their own team to invest their capital and typically the family foundation would also be under that umbrella. So under that amount, the economics don't really work out, so the family would be a client of Deutsche Bank, JP Morgan, and so on on the wealth management side. So when, when we say family offices, we mean families that have more than 100 million in wealth to deploy. Um, so family offices also typically think long term. They think in terms of legacy. They think generationally, not in terms of quarterly earnings or a five to seven year return as a fund does. So it presents an opportunity for a very different relationship as a funder, both philanthropic and on the investment side. So we have been working with um, over a thousand family offices around the world to really ensure that the capital they're deploying, again, both philanthropically and on the investment side, is deployed in the most optimal way towards the solutions that matter. So the three elements that we feel are really key for family offices to and other types of funders to be able to deploy capital most effectively are First, the science. If you don't understand the basic science involved in the solution that you're looking to fund, you're unlikely to make a good decision. And understanding the science is non-trivial. If you want to understand the science, there's a nice 1,700-page report uh, that's written in PhD language. I don't know many funders that would read a 1,700-page report. So one of the things we've done on the nonprofit side is summarize that into a nice 17-page report that explains concepts like eutrophication and, and so on, uh, recycling, plastics, etc. So understanding the science is critical. Understanding the ecosystem of funders, who else is funding in what area of um, ocean investment or philanthropy. And then the third is being able to understand when you're looking at an opportunity, can that solution do what it says it does, firstly. Secondly, is it the best in class to do so? If not, if there are 10 other better solutions, then of course you should fund one of those. And then the last is, is what type of, a, at that stage, what type of a solution 
value proposition is it? Is it a philanthropic opportunity? Uh, is it a investment opportunity, a debt opportunity, and so on. So we're building a, a knowledge platform for funders to help them navigate that process to A, ensure that the capital that's already been allocated to oceans is deployed more effectively, but secondly, to attract all of the capital that's sitting on the sidelines, that's not yet investing in oceans, but that could if provided the information and the, the process and the support to do so. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Lena. It's inspiring to hear the work you're doing to mobilizing capital on this most important work of helping our oceans thrive for the long term. Thank and thank you, you for bringing, uh, the expertise you're bringing as well. Our next uh, speaker is Luis uh, Rochat. Uh, so welcome, Luis. is the founder of Carbon Code. Carbon Code is a joint venture between MBI, the Natural Business Intelligence, and the Go Green Group. Carbon Code will be an operator in the carbon co credits market, working on the origination of credits from the management of rural areas or facilities, enabling the avoiding of, of emissions. He's um, also a partner of NBI and of Planetaire New Generation, an innovation hub for sustainability and regeneration. Fun fact, uh, his whole family from his great-grandfather is obsessed with tinned fish or canned <laughs> fish. His mother was so obsessed that when she was heavily pregnant with him, she nearly had Luis in the factory uh, of the canned fish. And he's now trying to teach his five-year-old grandson of the importance of canned fish. So, welcome. Thank you. First question, what are the challenges facing the functioning of carbon credit markets today, and which limit the effectiveness of this mechanism? Yeah, I think, I think it's, uh, it's quite important to, to deal with that because, for instance, we have a, f a flaw in the, in, the, in the process because even if uh, the, the Kyoto Protocol is already dead, we, we, haven't, uh, we don't have any, uh, any process that have uh, taken the place. Then we are uh, still using the, the, the mechanism that they were developed in that time and we are expecting that for the first time we will have strong markets in carbon. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not addressing the, the carbon tunnel situation that we have now, that everybody is talking about carbon and forgetting about other things. But I think it's quite important to have this new frame that we are, we are negotiating since Paris in 2015. But there, there is a lack for the organization of the market. We are still doing that. And at the same time, we are more focused on what we call it the carbon farming focus on forest and forest uh, management and we need to go to other to other sources for instance the ocean as we know and all the scientists gave the, this data but we don't have the the tools and we we are unable to assess what it will be the contribution of the oceans and how we could uh, uh, functioning markets and well uh, to to solve and to cope with this uh, challenge so we really need to understand uh, more so that we can get the carbon credit markets working uh, yeah. in the ocean. Wonderful. Second question, since the ocean's contribution to the resolution of greenhouse gas reduction goals is fundamental, is there also an essential function that is linked to biodiversity and how do you think they're linked? Yeah, as I was saying, all the things are connected. One of the things that we, we know the, today is that we don't have a silver, bu a silver bullet trying to have only one solution that it will cope to all the challenges. Then we need to do, to do everything in connection. We only have one planet and we have limits uh, of this planet. Then we need to manage everything and to, to get everything uh, connected. What uh, uh, you have already mentioned and my colleagues already mentioned is that maybe we know more about the, the, the surface of the moon than we know about, uh, about the seas and how they're functioning. And what is important is that nowadays we are getting to know better how the ecosystems interact and how we can uh, uh, manage in the proper way. But we need to have more and more, uh, uh, to learn a little, uh, uh, a lot of more from the ocean and trying to understand better what are the linkages and the, the ways that we will, we will uh, be able to improve. 
other, other way that it's quite important, it's about the natural processes. Uh, the, the nature has been for million and million uh, years improving the solutions for many problems. And we have a lot of uh, biodiversity, a lot of system functioning in the, in the sea, and we need to assess and to learn more to have this type of solutions applied elsewhere. Thank you. And then the final question. If the bioeconomy of the sea has a traditional component that works with many challenges, there are multiple opportunities for the development of a new bioeconomy of the sea. How can we ensure the solutions are sustainable? Yeah, this is a, a big problem that we have now with fisheries. This is the, the main one, okay. Now we, we have a lot of uh, different solutions. For instance, I'm as a Portuguese, when I go to different forums discussing that, when I say that I hit cod or sardines, everybody look at me with a, not a good face because <laughs> we are a quad hitter or whatever. But what, what we need to find out, it's not only the traditional one that we have, and they are quite basic, we need to understand better what we can take out of, of this. And more uh, uh, relating also again with biomimicry, how do we, we can utilize solutions and products and, and solutions that the, the, the nature have already developed and have improved so much that we can uh, introduce that in, uh, uh, naturally. And other way, it's that we have solutions now when, when we have a few of the, 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 the knowledge that we, uh, that we need to manage what we take out of the oceans today and what we take the fisheries and other 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 products we need to uh, improve it the management and to do it in a more sustainable way so understanding mm -hmm. is key for yeah. making everything sustainable mm -hmm. thank you Luis. Oh, our next speaker is fergal donica so fergal is a research scientist at ibm research in ireland his work focuses on applying simulation models analytics and machine learning techniques to assist operations in marine-based industries. This encompasses developing and um, deploying physics-based models that describe hydrodynamic conditions, optimizing these models to a variety of platforms and leveraging observational data to optimize forecast accuracy via data simulation. He has a PhD in civil engineering and his PhD studies the effects of aquaculture, installations on hydrodynamics and water quality by detailed laboratory and numerical modeling simulations. In short, he is an underwater rocket scientist. <laughs> so, welcome Fergal. Instead of, um, instead of us all moving to Mars, man, <laughs> we need an international ocean station. We need, to, we need to look at the ocean. You'll get on well. So, how can we develop trust in technical solutions to quantify ocean health, which I think speaks very much to Luis's last points. It's a very interesting question, because um, actually when I'm, I'm flying here on Monday, um, I was reading through my emails and whatnot, and at the same time, IBM announced um, with the Object Management Group and the Responsible Computing Initiative, co-founded with Dell and some other partners. And the focus of the Responsible Computing Initiative was, it's not, it's not about the bottom line. So it's, it's not the 1980s, we're not Michael Douglas on Wall Street. So it's not about the bottom line. It's about the quadruple bottom line. The quadruple bottom line is people, planet, profit, and impact. And what resonates is that quadruple bottom line, that is, I mean, that's what the reef company is doing. I mean, the impact, I mean, it's obvious what it does for the planet. It's scalable, it's, 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 a, it's a scalable business model. It, and I think that is the key focus or the key objective of what we need for ocean health. We need to have a clear focus and we need scalability. We cannot do this small. We cannot have a single international ocean station. We need many. We cannot have a single coral, coral reef. We need thousands. And the only way to do that is with that focus. And the question then becomes, if our focus is on people, planet, profit, impact, how do we get there? And it's about that focus on the responsible impact, that consideration on what are the what are the direct impacts of what we do, what are the secondary impacts, what are the tertiary impacts, and it's a case of quantifying those, understanding those, measuring those, and 
distributing those, so making those accessible to everybody. And the second part is around the responsible data. So, I mean, the reef company, I mean, they're collecting so much data, and I mean, that's not measuring physical obstacles, physical structures in the ocean. That's measuring the ocean. That's measuring biodiversity. That's measuring water. That's measuring water quality. That's measuring ocean health. So, how do we use that data, not just for the reef company, but for the planet? How do we use that to understand? What is, this, what is the current state of the ocean? What does a rejuvenated ocean look like? What does that mean for other, other industries that we can connect here with net zero or gain even positive impact? What does that mean about connecting coral reefs with renewable energy? What does that mean with building and expanding and continuously amplifying? So we're not just having a single focus on reefs in a single location for a single uh, point in space or time. We're having a holistic perspective of how do, the, how do these reefs um, impact, rejuvenate and modify the ocean? And what does that mean for our understanding? What does that mean for the science side? How can we, how can we bring in the, um, the marine biologists, the oceanographers? How can we bring in all these different stakeholders and amplify. And the key aspects there is around the breaking down of data silos and making data accessible. Because on Tuesday, I mean, um, on the panel, somebody in the audience raised a question about, well, how do I ensure my data is used for good? How do I ensure my, the data is used for net zero or positive ocean health that's not used for extractive purposes? And again, we can do that once we access and have availability and accessibility to that data, we can develop transparency about who collected that data, what does it measure, who, who can access that data, who is accessing that data, what are the different approaches or solutions that that data is used for. But the key challenges here is one, having the clear focus and objectives Two, having the vision, having the dream, working on that dream, and three, the bringing the different stakeholders, the different people, the different organizations, bringing them together so that everybody is building on what has gone before. We're not starting from scratch, but we're building, we're building, we're continuously expanding and amplifying. And that's where we develop trust from the different engagements between the public, the community, the scientists, the um, industry, and we develop impact, we scale, we go above and beyond what is achievable by, what, what, by what's achieved by one or two or five. We go, there's no limits, we can go forever. Uh, so it's a, there's a coming together around understanding, there's a coming to set together around designing, coming together about impacting, and if we do all that with trust, we can go for the stars, we can stoop the moon. Yeah, amazing. And then maybe last question, what role does IBM Research have in Oceans for Good? It's a good question. Well, I guess it's worth pointing out, I mean, IBM are 110, over 110 years old. I mean, a lot has changed in the past 110 years. But the one thing that hasn't changed is IBM focus on deploying technology where we can have the maximum impact. I mean, back in the day, that was typewriters, that was mainframes, that was database. So today, I mean, where can you have the most impact? We have to fix the planet, right? We have to fix the planet. So how do you do that? I mean, the most direct path of fixing the planet is we fix the ocean. So how do we fix the ocean? We come here today, we work with um, people like on the panel here, we work with people in the room here, we focus on deploying our technologies, deploying our people, deploying our resources on that single issue. Because I mean, at the end of the day, the, today, in, I mean, in 2022, the only thing that matters is our planet is on the verge of breakdown. The only thing that matters is fixing that. All the rest, I mean, it's childish victory. Brilliant, thank you so much, Virgo, and uh, for your inspiring messages. Our final speaker before we get you uh, all involved, is uh, Jerome van der Waal. Welcome, Jerome. He's the founder and CEO, or as he calls himself, the Reef Chief, 
of the <laughs> Reef Company. Jerome believes our oceans are in trouble and he's on a mission to assemble a multitude of advocates who are prepared to bring our oceans back from the brink of destruction. He's also the founder of Orca Nation, or Chief Orca, which offers school children and adults life-changing experiences in the ocean. He's also author of the book, We Can Turn Tides. He believes, we believe that in order to care about the oceans, you first have to experience it. So welcome, Jerome. First Thanks, question, Rick. what is the benchmark for success? What is your dream? Um, my dream is to um, create partnerships um, with people like we have in the panel today. I was looking for salespeople and I found five. So um, <laughs> we, we want to build 2,500 engineered reefs around the planet. Uh, of about 50 square kilometers per reef. Um, we need about 500 billion US dollars to build these reefs around the planet to absorb all the carbon that we are producing today in excess, generating global warming, uh, creating a very miserable outlook for our children and grandchildren. And I believe that that is what we all have to do together in this room and on the planet. We have to come up with solutions and partnerships that are showing the next generations that we can make money and do good all the time by building uh, healthy ecosystems that are going to rejuvenate the oceans, give life back to the oceans, absorb carbon, generate oxygen, and put a new balance back in this planet. And we can only do that by building partnerships with governments, with people like Ruben, with Lisa and the underwater uh, research stations, with Fergal and IBM building a cloud system for us to collect ocean data that we can use to measure what we are doing, to show us what the KPIs are and the progress that we are making, with people that are specializing in regulated carbon trading, giving us the opportunity to create a perpetuum mobile when it comes to generating cash flow and income to finance our assets, and um, um, yeah, to, to, to show uh, you know, all the, all the young people on this planet, that there is hope, that there is a positive outlook, and that we are capable together to turn this whole misery around. So that's, that's, that's what we want to achieve. Yeah. It's an inspiring dream. Yeah. So all these people here are obviously going to be interested. How do others get involved in the project? Um, we have uh, designed a uh, integrated uh, uh, model for good. Um, I don't want to be, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, a guy that has a business with hundreds of thousands of people on the payroll. Uh, I would, uh, would get sleepless nights by that, uh, by that idea. Uh, we want to build a global organization that is going to work with, with huge partnerships, like with companies like IBM, with companies like Microsoft, with companies like Proteus. Um, where we can give uh, employment and job opportunities around the globe to people that are doing good, where we can motivate um, local communities and societies in emerging countries where they basically need our solutions most, uh, the opportunity to create sustainable local economies. Um, um, our uh, uh, reef technology is almost going to be like an open source technology. Um, we want to give everybody on this planet the opportunity to build these reefs and join our reef network. Um, and, and, and I think that is how we are going to do it, Mac. Yeah. Wonderful. It's an invitation for everyone to yes. get involved. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. OK, welcome. So, um, so hopefully you've, been, you've enjoyed, and I know I've learned a huge amount already in, in, in our session so far, but also there's some magic in every one of you here who've come here to make a difference for the oceans. So the invitation is to go and find three or four people you do not know and just have a conversation about what are you most interested in about Oceans for Good? And what help do you need? What are you trying to do? And just have a conversation. We'll give you 15 minutes to have this conversation. If any of you find this um, an awkward experience, remember that life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So please, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up, find three or four people you do not know, and have that conversation. Does that sound OK? And have faith <laughs> that magic is going to happen in your conversation. Okay, so 15 minutes, uh, take your earphones off obviously. We'll bring back, come back, find three or four people you do not know. What are you interested in? What help do you need? We'll bring you back together in 15 minutes. Thank you. So has anyone got a question or a perspective that they would love to share with the room? If you would put your hand up, we would love to hear from you. Or can you volunteer? So, have we got someone? Oh, thank you so much. 
So if we can bring a microphone over. If you could just say your name as you introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Afonso. Um, I want to thank the panelists uh, for all the insights and everything we shared. There's a lot of people that I've met today. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that I met today who, as I did one day, not a scientist, have feared getting involved in the ocean. I'd love to hear from the panelists when you do do your call to actions, because I'm just sharing that, how can we get more individuals involved who have no relationship today with the ocean? As you said before, uh, Lina, um, people who have not dipped their toe in the ocean. So if you can share, how can we involve them? How not to fear that this is a world of scientists, that this is a world of silos, where we need to build more partnerships, and that they could get involved, and they can build a life filled with purpose and profit. I think that would be very interesting, because I myself have converted, and I wish more people do too. Thank you. I would like to take that question. I, I can start. Um, I, I think that's a great point. I think that's really part of our mission, right, is to make people fear the ocean less. Uh, I also think it's about not having a connection necessarily with the ocean if you don't live near the ocean, right? So how do we cor correct that? Uh, virtual reality and technology today, I think, is an amazing way to do that. We know that virtual reality, and there have been tests in Stanford University uh, with kids that have virtual, have using virtual reality to learn about the ocean and kids that are not using it. And virtual reality actually teaches empathy about our ocean. So the kids that were using the virtual reality glasses were asking questions about the coral. Why is the coral white? Why, why is that fish you know, eating this and that? And the other kids were not asking as many questions. So I think we have a huge opportunity. We carry around you know, smartphones. That's knowledge in our pocket. And sometimes I think kids and even us, we use our phones for not very good reasons where we have uh, knowledge at our fingertips. But it's on us as executives, entrepreneurs, activists, and people who do love the oceans, it's our duty to show people, to tell people, to tell people the stories, right? Why are we all here at this conference? Or burned a little bit too much carbon footprint. We, we wouldn't be doing a, a service if we, we stop it, not telling the stories that are success, right? Of, of the successes and the great stories about the Goliath grouper and a story about the cavitational bubble and Sylvia and, Il and Earl that has lived her whole life in the ocean. So there's much less to fear. We just have to start sharing those stories. May so, I please. May I build on um, what Lisa just shared, um, the virtual reality piece in particular. So uh, we realized that in order for solutions to be deployed and the, to accelerate the solution deployment process, culture shift has to play a really important part in that, and that involves education and awareness and so on. So we've spent the last four or five years looking for who are the top communicators in the world, where is the attention of different subgroups that we could essentially uh, utilize as a platform for these messages. So we've worked with Hollywood producers, we've worked with music producers. Um, one of our partners is a music star who uh, three and a half million people see his show when he does a global show. So he came to us and said, when I tell people to do something, they do it. What should I be telling them to do? So it's those kinds of unconventional opportunities that we look for going beyond the public service announcements and so on to where people's attention is. We're working with another group that's developing video games for kids and adults to embed these narratives about oceans, about plastics, et cetera, into uh, video games. And we're working currently with one of the top VR companies to build a VR scenario for plastic awareness. So rather than learning from a video or a PowerPoint or a presentation, you could have an immersive experience, as Lisa was saying, where you're underwater and you see the, the magnificence of the ocean, and then all of a sudden you notice there's more and more pieces of plastic around you, and it turns from this magical place to this polluted place uh, in, 
with plastic all around you. And then you can grab a piece of plastic and take it to the lab, virtually grab, of course. And in the lab, you can see that that piece of plastic is 50 times more toxic than when it went in to the ocean. And you can learn about all these concepts in an experiential way. So there's an opportunity to use many different mediums to, um, to, get, to, to get people's attention uh, in a way that's relevant to their everyday life and the platforms that they're going to for information and entertainment. Thank you. Final, final answer, please. Thank you. Fear. Um, that's the... Um, when you are young or, or a kid and you go for your first dive in the ocean, fear, that's what you feel. But then you take the plunge, you, know, you take a leap of faith and then you go. I, when I heard your question, I remembered when I first, five years old, six years old, in Madeira Island, because in Madeira Island there is uh, very few beaches with sand. In my time, there, is, there was only one, very tiny, and very far away from Funchal. So uh, I had to go to a rock and dive. That's it. Uh, so you have to learn to overcome your fear. And also that also translates into the fear of investment, because what is there? It's the unknown. Okay. The unknown and also it's a different environment. We don't live yet with Proteus, probably, mm -hmm. yet, you know, in, in the ocean. So it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different planet. It's, if you think, you know, it's in, if you, you know, brainstorm in, in a way, we don't have one planet, we have two planets in one, because the rules of life also in the deep, ultra deep sea ecosystems are completely different uh, from what we have, have here. Uh, and if you want to know probably how life is in, a, in the outer system, uh, we have to study better how it is uh, developed, it has developed in, out, in, in our ecosystem. But going to solutions, what can be done? First, to overcome that fear is to increase the knowledge. And not only with virtual reality, by the way, the, the, Navy, the Portuguese Navy runs the uh, Vasco da Gama Aquarium in the west part of the town and it was it was on, it is one of the oldest aquariums uh, in, in the world if I'm not to mistake and it has a, a kind of VR augmented reality experience really designed in that way and you can you know observe and learn from the real you know animals that are, that are there and corals and the, and it's very accessible, and for kids, it's very good. And with the old natural, the traditional conventional natural history museum. That's a part of it. But then you have to go to the real deal. And the real deal, and I'll be fast, learn how to swim in open waters, learn how to, learn how to sail. So it should be easy for schools uh, it's uh, yes, and we're not to drive. Well, that's, <laughs> that's but uh, uh, it's easier for, for, uh, for it, uh, selling than driving. I could say, but it's, it's more intuitive. <laughs> but to say this, uh, 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 true impact. Invest a lot on maritime education, and when I say I say maritime because maritime has to do with the technology. Where the, where for using the ocean. Ocean, you have to, it's the, the, the knowledge of the ecosystem, but maritime, the learning how to sail, the types of boats, and there are many ways to sail as the surf and stand up paddle. So all of this is overcomes our fears. Wonderful. Thank you. So we're just on time. Um, just to finish off, um, I'm excited to say there's going to be a signing ceremony uh, with the Reef Company and strategic partners uh, that have, uh, have, have agreed over this week, which is exciting. So we're going to do a quick signing ceremony in a moment. Um, but before I just uh, thank, thank you and thank the speakers, I'd like to invite each, each speaker in 30 seconds or less a call to action to this group. 
Um, what would you like your biggest call to action to be? And so, Luis, if I may start with you, what's your call to action? Yeah, regarding what we were discussing uh, later, I think it's each of one needs to build his own storytelling about about the ocean. Build your storytelling about the ocean. Beautiful, mm -hmm. Ruben. Learn to sail and learn to swim. <laughs> learn to sail, learn to swim, but not drive. <laughs> I have two very quick, specific calls to action. One is we have an ocean prize for plastic pollution, so we're looking for innovators working on 3D printing solutions. So if you or someone you know are working on that, please submit it. We launched yesterday. And then we also have an ocean AI lab that we launched yesterday as well with our partners Fruit Punch AI here in the back. So if you have a challenge um, that needs solving where AI can be helpful or would like to learn more or partner with us, we'd love to hear from you. Or if you have any other thoughts or ideas for how we can be helpful or support your work, we'd love to do so. Thank you. Accelerate. We all know how much damage we've done to the ocean in the past 50 years. We've, we have to fix it in five. And we need, we need engagement, we need everybody for that. We need the scientists, the engineers, the technologists. We need the artists, the poets, the communicators. And we need to focus fast, speed, accelerate. Accelerate. Lisa. Well, I have two things. I think that no action is too small. So on an individual basis, anything that you do will help to contribute. Don't use a straw don't eat meat for one day a week, whatever that is. No action is too small, and I think that's a message for our children as well. And I would say the last thing is capital. So if you are in a position to bring capital to early stage ideas, because we need investment in our ocean more than anything to save our planet. No action too small. And Jerome? Uh, stop talking uh, <laughs> and uh, start doing. Yeah. Um, what we heard uh, in the last few days is uh, that we have three to five years left. Um, so, you know, a few years ago people said we have 20 years left and now they are saying we have three to five years left. Um, I have the feeling that 99% of the global population doesn't even understand what that means. So we should act immediately. And I think everybody should open up to the oceans 70% of everything you do every day is directly connected with the oceans. So we don't have any choice, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Great way to end. Fantastic. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> so, just to say that tomorrow uh, it will be here at 10 o'clock. Peter Thompson, the special, the special envoy for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the ocean from the, uh, from the Secretary General. At 10 o'clock here he will give a speech and this is what the gentleman is looking for, is for initiatives, like the ones from the Reef County, of what is happening here. It's not a call to action, it's going to action. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. So, please be here. <laughs> thank you. So to close uh, the event, first of all, a massive uh, gratitude to you all for giving your precious time for being here today and being part of the process. And a, a special thank you to all our speakers, to so Luis, Ruben, Nina, uh, uh, Virgo. Virgo, sorry, <laughs> and Lisa, Jerome, um, a massive thank you to you all. And uh, if I may invite a round of applause, please. Thank you. And if I can invite, we'll have the signing ceremony over to you. Great. Hello? You guys can hear me? Very good. Um, I'm from the Reef Company, for those who don't know. So uh, I have the privilege to be making a recognition to one of uh, our most important values of our company, which is working with partners. Um, we value all of our partners. So what we do is we use this opportunity to recognize the partners we work with and thank them in a special way. Uh, today we've nominated five partners that are in, uh, already in MOU stage completion. We are moving ahead and we've already signed with Microsoft, with IBM, 
in other partners. Today we have more partners that we are going to share with you. Um, I would like to call the, um, the companies uh, and the representatives to the stage to start with the uh, ceremony, signature ceremony, and then at the end, I'm going to ask the whole uh, team to stand up here for the photograph for the entire for the for the um, for people to take it home. So what I would like to do is start to call one by one, company one by one, to the stage uh, for the signature. The first company that we are asking to come to the uh, table is going to be uh, Best Emotions. So we're going to uh, invite H uh, Hugo Almeida uh, to join the table. Um, for those who don't know, I would be surprised uh, that you don't know who, what uh, Best Emotions are. They are an event management company and they are uh, one of the best we've ever worked with and we are extremely happy to be signing this uh, MOU with, um, with uh, Best Emotions. Uh, beyond just the event management, we will also be doing the, uh, business development together. Um, so we are looking to take Best Emotions also across the, uh, the uh, international markets. So we have here Hugo Almeida and Julio Iglesias, uh, sorry, Barbas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Much more. <laughs> okay, the next, the next uh, partner we uh, will be uh, Innovation 4.4. Uh, I don't think Lena needs any introduction. She's been one of the most amazing people here this week. Um, we are very, very fortunate to be uh, signing this agreement uh, with uh, Innovation 4.4. We will be taking our partnership beyond borders. So in other words, this is going to be an international global deployment. So uh, I don't know, Lynn, if you want to say a couple of words to this partnership. You, you don't have to. You just need to sign. That's all we need. So thank you so much. Do you want to say something? Or? I just want to thank you. We are really looking forward to working with you on this project and uh, there are so many interesting aspects of what you're doing where we can connect some of the global network of innovators, whether it's material science innovators and other types of companies that can accelerate what you're doing and really add to the amazing vision and plan that you've put together. So thank you. We look forward to working with you. Yeah. Thank you and uh, welcome to the, uh, the community. partner will be C2 Capital. Um, it is our uh, uh, example of wanting to partner with local entities as well, but also take them beyond borders as well. So C2 Capital um, is one of the leading finance companies uh, in Portugal. I'm going to ask um, André Oliveira to represent uh, C2 Capital uh, in the signature. And I'm going to ask André if nobody knows what C2 Capital is. Do you want to leave a couple of words just to explain what you do? Uh, th thank you thank you all very much for, for coming to, to Lisbon to share your thoughts about, about the ocean. And thank you, Manuel, for this invitation. Uh, for the ones that, that don't know, C2 Capital Partners, we are the top three private equity fund, fund managers here in Portugal. Uh, we manage over 600 million uh, euros uh, that belong to over uh, 500 uh, investors from 28 uh, countries uh, around, the, uh, around the globe. And uh, basically we are multi-sector um, fund managers, so we have funds that invest in, in tourism, in uh, industry, in beverages, uh, we have a couple that, that invest in R&D, and um, basically Manuel and Jerón uh, convinces that the ocean is not uh, an investment for the future but for the present. Um, and what call our attention is that there are so many so many funds and so many institutions that are doing small things and the reef company has a ten key solution that we believe that is is the present and is what you call the attention of, of the investors uh, not only from portugal but from many countries around the globe so i'm glad that we are here to celebrate this partnership with, with the reef company and uh, with this team 
and uh, looking forward to, to work with you together. So from the money, we move to the science. Um, we have the money partners, now we're going to move to the science partners and we would like to invite to the stage Professor Vitor Vasconcelos from CIMAR. CIMAR is a, is a leading research and, and, um, and in, in investigation um, uh, research uh, institute of Portugal. Up in the north, by the way, is my neighbor. And uh, so we are uh, very glad to be in this partnership with uh, CIMAR. CIMAR, could you just explain, uh, Vitor, could you just explain in two words or three words what CIMAR does, please? Because I guess a lot of people don't know. Well, CIMAR, as you said, is a research center that is located in Matuzinhos and Porto. Uh, we have three main research lines. Uh, uh, we work on global changes and ecosystem services, where we want to understand the biodiversity and the, also the aggressions to the environment caused by human activities, marine biotechnology, as well as aquaculture and seafood quality. So it's very nice for us to be with you. We are really looking forward to this partnership and hope we can be at the great. Okay. Thank you so much. And now, last but not least, Spaceship Underwater. We'd like to invite uh, Proteus um, to the signature. <laughs> and for that, we'll invite uh, Lisa Marocchino, and uh, she's uh, the CEO of uh, Proteus. Uh, you've heard a lot about her, about Proteus, and about a name that she's going to talk about, uh, which I would like you to surprise the entire audience, please. Thank you so much. You've heard a lot from me tonight, but I, as you mentioned, our visionary and uh, ocean thought leader, Fabien Cousteau. Would you join me, please, on stage? Thank you. I'm going to pass it to him so he'll say a few words. I keep getting surprised by these few words. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a fantastic conference. This is a momentous occasion. Thank you for inviting us to be part of this. The ocean needs uh, our help more than ever, so this kind of partnership is an illustration of the next fin step in ocean conservation. And not only symbolically, but pragmatically speaking, I hope all of us will be part of that forward movement, not only in talking about ocean solutions, but creating and implementing ocean solutions. So thank you very much for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm now going to ask all of the uh, partners to. Sorry, if you can come back up for the picture. Sorry about that. I'm so sorry. This is the afternoon exercise. <laughs> So, uh, for the cameras, those that would like to take a picture, uh, turn to stand. Uh, one of the. Thank you so much, everybody, uh, for this opportunity. Um, once we finish with the um, uh, pictures, I would like to ask a favor. Could we all clap to our partners over here and, uh, and a warm welcome to our community? Thank you so much. OK, so um, just to, this will conclude. I'm going to pass it over to my founder, uh, uh, Jeroen. He's going to close the session. Jeroen? Je it's okay. Now it's too late. No, it's not in the picture. It's okay. So Jeroen, could you close the event and uh, we'll be inviting the, uh, the people to the dinner. So it's your, it's your show now. <laughs>
No, I think we have had enough uh, talking, so uh, let's start walking. <laughs> um, I really appreciate uh, the great uh, attendance that we had uh, the last uh, few days. Um, for us, this was one of the best events we have ever done. Uh, a lot of positive traction. We signed 15 partnerships. Um, we are talking about projects uh, in the Philippines, in Brazil, in Costa Rica, in Portugal. Um, most probably I'm forgetting some places, but I believe we are building up a very good momentum. I'm very positive about the future and everything that we can achieve together. So please join us for our um, uh, uh, dinner uh, uh, and networking event. And uh, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much. Yeah.